Hey, hey, everybody, this is Brad Dyke, starting another video on this very impressive little box. As you can see here across the board, you are looking at basically one of the series HP ProLiant DL360G7 series. A friend of mine across the ocean got a G6 in his hands, which I have some of those as well, but... I told him that, hey, you know, I'll go in and I'll take a look and do a, a, an active configuration review on the G7 because I have two of them. One that's just received a series of processors that are smoking hot. The best, second best of the all processors available to the platform. Um, and I was stunned to see how well, perform, how well it performed. Also, um, as you can see here is information pertaining to platform information. Uh, this was my ESX node environment, node one out of four. And this is a diagnostic post display screen that uh, is made available to you. If you think a situation happens, you got your PS2, one and two, your power capabilities, your overpower temp configurations, fans, memory configuration processors, and so on and so on. So basically, uh, it tells you very quickly, idiot light wise, what you got now you also have your 15 pin VGA output your UID interface and of course your power indicator and a USB output the overall DVD drive setup rewritable for building recovery disks your disks themselves and of course let's go to the back on the back side you can see your IO bus card you can see that I've put in a USB 3.0 card and they're in support for high speed transfer rates that you don't normally get because the USB on board is just so weak. Here you got below your USB ports, management control, and of course your management controls over here, and your serial output, uh, your VGA output, and your four, your quad bridge one gig sessions. Uh, to my great surprise, I saw that the common bus is 460, 460 watt output across the board without spiking or, or tripping over to the second power supply. Which means, if you're like me and you have a limited budget, you don't want to hook these two guys up together and let them just burn idle power, plug only one in, and slightly displace the other as such. Leave it like that. You still have a backup. It's just the unit will fail, and then you push this guy in, and then your backup engages. It's basically known as a passive non-active failover so it ha you, requires you to interact with it so with that being said let's just take a look at the underside of this bad boy now the only concern I have with this chassis is this area right in here initially it's the only real headache or heartburn I have but this platform is sweet it really is very sleek and component wise and it's in a configuration that is very easy to work with and you'll be able to lift out your cards hang on a second here okay and we're going to play it this is a uh, raid card battery variant capacitor charge yeah, that's not quite charged yet so it's not happy with me but you basically have your standard style RAID uh, configuration mini card here. You have your IO bus set up here, which is your long card. In this case, we're using a long card for USB, as you can see here. And it is a long card. And then over here, we have a short card that has not been used yet. And the short card can take a 10 gig NIC, which is usually the equation in this particular situation. But I decided not to as of yet. Next, you will see that the device also has the ability of doing quite a few other little things that were surprising. One of them, of course, is the nature of the localized drive. And localized drives are impressive, to say the least. But the nature of a localized drive uh, is in how you handle the different varieties of your boot options. So what would those boot options look like?
Well, that's a good question. That's why this little setup is pretty sweet. Um, this platform has options. And in its small footprint, you think, no way. But when you look at the memory configuration, and this one's not even fully populated. If you look down there, there are empty bays here still. But she's got 46 gigs of RAM on board, which give quite a bit of firepower for the processors at which we were working. But these are the standard processors. So if you come in and you look at the processors, um, these are the intro le level style stack processors, unlike the, the 56 series 75s, which I got on my second G7, which is over here. Right there it is. And this one has more memory on board, and it's booted, and you can see here that it's running smoothly without any issues. And it's providing, basically I turned this guy into a glorified high-end Oracle slash Microsoft slash SQL slash Minecraft server and several other slashes because it can just do it. It's got 24 processors and 94 gigs of RAM. Lots of space capacity, functionalized, RAID-based, or HBA single disk drive-based if you want. You can make these controllers do that. But that's not the only thing that's really cool about this. Externalized power. Which means you could put an I.O. card in here, a fairly sizable I.O. card in here, that if it requires extended power output, you can actually do that. You've got your setup back, passway power here as well. Very nice to have that. But if you look a little closer, you'll see that there is also a 128 gig boot SD card here and a 64-bit USB localized card here. That is very nice to have um, and nice in regards to pairing up a boot device and still have that external capacity that you can work with and that is nice. So with that being said, which I'll take that out later, that SD card can boot the operating system and it can be controlled isolated only internally to the chassis so nobody can get to it. Outside of that, the heat sink dissipation process is really low, which means it just doesn't get hot. The I.O. bridge cart comes out very easily. You just have to basically release the screws in these two areas here in the back. And then, of course, you want to release the tighteners on the, on the back of the chassis, these two blue screws. Basically, blue screw, blue screw, blue screw, and so on. And you pull this tray out, populate your card in, and push the card back into place and allow you to do what you want to do. Okay, once the I.O. bridge card has been removed, and as you can see it here, there's a full-size 16X based PCIe standard, and of course it has the 8X standard, which is more than enough, I think, for a 1U footprint uh, in this situation. And then here, you see the actual active chipsets, including the ATIs. I don't know why they have ATI still. It's a headache, but I won't go there. You also see what the common bus is looks like, and you can see the PQF interfaces onto the actual solder uh, board in relationship to the processor stacks. You can see the backup connection for the RAID controller. In this case, the RAID controller that we're working with here is a 400 series P, um, and it has a 256 meg cache ratio on it. These prove to be somewhat troublesome because people don't know how to bring them on board well uh, and to swap them out correctly. So they keep getting what they think are dead units, but actually they have to properly initialize the rate configuration component to make sure the card is reauthorized, uh, to make sure the battery is reauthorized to support the caching function. So that leaves these 2.4 gigahertz, one, one, uh, 1066 based. Uh, processor stacks which you know these are pretty decent these are the ones I got from the actual uh, onset uh, on the second G7 I have over there I went to the second highest processor stack which were two bridge 12s at 3.0 gigahertz and that gave me 24 core processors um, to work with in regards to anything such as VMing 
or high yield computational handling and so on and so on. Um, these machines are just great little workhorses, impressive on their formats. And um, with that being seen, I'll show you the difference between this standard one, which I've not really upgraded yet, uh, versus the one I have upgraded. So you can see the consider considerable differences in processing power. Stand by for a minute. One thing I wanted to bring up before I move on to the actual comparisons of uh, the different processor stacks, uh, I wanted to make note of was the fact that um, with these with these setups, like you see this here now, uh, there's a problem with these chassis, and I don't like it. Never been, I never liked it. Uh, whenever it happens, and I make it a point to point it out. This metal is not folded, which means basically. They are taking the time to frame the metal, and yet the metal has really not the greatest integrity when it comes to strength and handling. So if this insert is not properly put in place and properly battened down on all screws, the ability to torque the frame is very scary, which means when you handle this unit, you have to understand that this thing is fragile, much more fragile than, let's say, a 2U footprint version of the G7. Its metals are very thin, and they're not folded over and brought over, which gives a lot more strength to it, but it also gives weight to it. And you see some oddities about how they try to use other, device, uh, other components like this cross rail, like the power supply brick, and even some of the beveling here. Don't pick this system up unless you've put the lid on, because the lid is actually folded on the ends, but only on the ends, and gives the additional strength to the sides of the server chassis. It's just a pet peeve of mine. I think when you design stuff like this, that it should be fairly dur durable from a simple Oops, I didn't grab it right and it hit the data center floor. Not good. But I just wanted to bring that up to you so that you have an idea of what that is. And uh, But now we're going to go to the processor comparison. So I'm going to go ahead and set this up. I'll be back. Okay, right now I'm booting this system up and it's going through the normal post diag state. And with that being the case, this is going to be a fairly streamlined process of installing Windows Server 2019 and just doing the one, two, threes as an introduction. But um, when this is done, I will show you the display screen of this ratio versus the display screen of my other G7 to just kind of give you a performance rating on between what you can get at um, a place like, um, I'd say like eBay, um, that you would be able to get pretty comfortable with how it all will work so as the system is beginning to post I have to go in and clear out a configuration and do several things real fast but I will be back so in this version of the boat boot post here you see the basic 2.4 gigahertz e5620 series processors for a total of 16 baseline processors now, the other system has E5675 processors that are much more powerful than these, um, and they do pretty good. But actually, I was kind of surprised how well the 5620s did initially. Um, are they the cutting edge of today? No, but who can afford those kind of things at this time? But for all you guys out there and gals who want to learn this stuff, uh, and it's not costing you a lot because this is all free for me, I just wanted to show you how this was set up. Okay, at this point in stage, Windows 2019 is being installed on the G7 series. And as you can see here, I've got performance test 10.0 evaluation, of course, because how many different versions of these do we have, really? But uh, this is the 75 series processor stack, as you can see here uh, on the principal property attributes for this particular server. The X5675 series stack is very nice. I've got to admit, I, I'm pleased with it. It just takes off 
Uh, it cost me $25 a processor. Uh, that was something that I just couldn't pass up. And to see what it gave me uh, core-wise, uh, it's just so impressive. 44 gigs divided by the principles of what you see here uh, really gives us the ability to uh, turn a little 1U footprint into quite a, a powerful little powerhouse. And I have many things running in the background here, but for part two, I will go ahead and uh, get the operating system installed on the 5620, which is not quite as many cores as this, but it definitely is pretty, pretty stoked in my opinion as well. Um, because the, the 12 cores I have here, which give me the 24 cores versus my eights, uh, that, that tells me that I've got um, the substantial capacity to be able to upgrade my platform without really having to pursue the Series 2U footprint G7, which is this guy right here. Uh, he's actually pretty powerful too, but he's just a mere extension of what the 1U is. So look for part two and I'll let you go. Bye.